Social media can be a great place for inspiration, community building, getting growth tips, but social media has the tendency of making everything seem so much easier than it actually is. When it comes to growing plants, failure is inevitable. It will happen at some stage. So in today's video, I wanna give you 10 hard-hitting truths about growing plants indoors. Jeez, saying 10 hard-hitting truths is a bit of a mouthful. Super random, but I found two dice and every morning, first thing when I get up, I roll the dice and I'm hoping for a double. And this morning, I rolled a double six on first, first attempt. So I'm very excited. Today's going to be a good day. Hey everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today's video is inspired by a short I posted just a little while ago. <laughs> it's just moss. I'm a failure. <laughs> I can't keep any plants alive. Uh, oh no, a brown spot. Uh, uh, it'll be fine. Nobody will know, nobody will know. This is your final warning. It's you, not me. If you have root rot one more time, you're gone. Uh, mealy bugs again. I'll just put it outside, huh? I've had really positive feedback on the back of that video because people really like the, let's say like reality check and kind of just showing that no, not everything is perfect. We just kind of learned how to deal with the imperfection over time. So I thought, yes, exactly. Oh, sorry, you are perfect. You are perfect, but you're not a house plant, you know? So I thought, why not take this idea, but put a little bit more structure behind it. So in today's video, I want to share 10 things that are necessarily the glorious part of growing houseplants, but that are challenges or truths that you will at some stage face. And I want to openly talk about it so that we all know that these issues or these challenges are also just normal and part of the hobby. And hopefully that helps somebody feel a little bit more positive about it and a little bit more relaxed about it. Yes, you will have yellow or brown leaves. Even if you grow your plants in the perfect conditions and if you provide them with the perfect care, a leaf has a limited lifespan. Some leaves live for longer, some leaves live for a shorter amount of time, like a philodendron varicosum, for example. I've never really had success in keeping a varicosum leaf looking nice for longer than maybe eight months or so, whereas maybe some monstera leaves can look nice for maybe even a couple of years. But at the end of the day, plants are living organisms, so at some stage, the oldest leaf will go yellow, hello, so at some stage, that oldest leaf will go yellow and then eventually brown and the plant will drop it even if you've done everything correctly. Of course, yellowing and browning leaves can also be encouraged by terrible conditions or poor care routines and so on. But at the end of the day, it's something that you really can't avoid. You can delay it, but you can't avoid it. So don't stress out about yellowing or browning leaves, especially if it's the oldest leaf. So yeah, absolutely no reason to stress. Secondly, very similar to that, sometimes a leaf might just have a yellow spot or a yellow edge or it might be slightly deformed or it might have like a brown spot somewhere and so on. That is also perfectly normal. I have imperfections on all of my plants. Look at this, this has a bit missing here, this has something missing, this is browning, browning. I think sometimes I have, I have so many plants that when I show them to you on social media and you see them on a teeny tiny phone screen, I think they just come across as more perfect than they actually are. Most of my plants have imperfections. I hardly ever have a perfect leaf. And even if I would have a perfect leaf, I know that that perfect leaf will eventually no longer be perfect. So I'm not aiming for perfection with these leaves in the first place. I just accept the imperfections as normal. And I'm trying to put as much B-roll on screen or next to me or something like that to actually show you some of my plants up close and show you these imperfections. But when you see them as a collective, when you see them as you know my, my entire house, the way that I decorate my house, you don't end up focusing on the imperfections. Sometimes 
I'm pissed off about it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that this is a desired outcome. And yeah, sometimes I just go ahead and chop some yellow edges off because I don't like the look of them. Sometimes I chop a leaf off because I think it's ugly, you know, which is obviously not necessarily the best thing to do for the plant's um, sake, but well, it's my hobby, so I get to make the rules. But at the end of the day, I don't, I don't stress about it. I don't freak out about it. I just accept it for what it is. And it's not always a reflection of you doing something wrong as well. And it's not always pests. And it's not always like something else. There's not always a sinister reason behind why a leaf might not be perfect. Even in nature, leaves are not perfect. Plants are not perfect. They have deformations, they have yellow spots, they have holes, they have all sorts of things. So why would we have a different standard for our plants indoors? Which leads me to my next point. It is about making compromises. You have to accept the fact that we are dealing with living organisms and they might not behave in the way that you want them to behave. That's just it. You cannot control every single aspect of the plant's growth. Yes, you control the conditions that the plant is growing in and you can try and match them as closely as possible to the natural environment. You can try and optimize the the care and match the care to the conditions that your plants are growing in. But at the end of the day, these are all plants. All plants come from the outside world. There are no such thing as indoor plants. There are just some plants that are suitable to be grown indoors because their natural conditions outside are not all too different to the conditions that we've got available inside. I personally obviously like aeroids. But I've got a lot of comments recently. I've uploaded this video where I took some plants and I put them outside in the rain to let the rain water them. And I've had so many comments from people saying, but isn't it bad for indoor plants to get rain? There is no such thing as indoor plants, right? Like it's just an outdoor plant that we have decided to put inside. We have decided to take a plant that's normally growing on the forest floor or in the canopy of a tree and put it in a pot. We air condition or heat our houses and so on, right? So we are not ever going to be able to give these plants a true to nature experience. So we also can't expect true to nature growth and true to nature perfection despite the fact that nature isn't perfect in the first place. So it is about compromising and just accepting some sort of limitations that will always come with growing indoors. Talking about accepting things, you will also just have to accept that pests are inevitable. That one video went uh, viral on all platforms and I've had so many comments. And another comment besides people asking if rain is bad for indoor plants was whether me taking my plants outside isn't just infecting the plants with pests. Now, obviously it depends on whereabouts you live, but if that theory would be correct, wouldn't that mean that there's zero plants outside because everything is infected by pests? I personally actually experience way less pest issues with my plants that are growing outside because outside it also has harsher conditions even for the pests. Outside, the pests also have natural predators and so on. Uh, it rains, for example, and just wipes the pests away. It won't eradicate them, but we have to accept that pest eradication is highly unlikely unless you're living in a lab but you probably don't. You live in a house and the house plants are just your decoration. You don't need to take your plants outside for them to get infected with pests. You can also bring the pests inside. You probably have your windows open, you might add a new plant to the collection and so on. There's so many ways of pests finding their way. I've also had a few comments where people ask if it's not dangerous for my leaves my plants to touch each other because pests could then like transfer from one plant to the other. Also bad news, these pests can fly. <laughs> like you don't need leaves to touch. They don't operate like humans where we need to build a little bridge. Pests will find a way to get onto your plants. Just accept it and that does not make you a bad plant parent or bad grower or unlucky or whatever. Everybody is experiencing that. Now what I do to minimize their impact is I'm trying to be as proactive as possible. Pests are inevitable but pests doesn't mean it needs to be straight away an infestation and the pest taking over to the extent that the plant is dying. Yes, there might be some visual pest damage on the plant here and there if I was a bit lazy or was a bit slow, but most of the time I just take my plants outside. Ideally, I would do that weekly with every watering, but 
I just try and take them outside as many times as possible and I just spray them down. I hoist them down, even with just water. You don't always need to straight away go to chemicals. You can also put a bit of neem oil in there if you want to, but just keeping your plants healthy, happy and clean is already giving the plant a good time fighting off pests kind of by themselves or not, or not be so easily damaged beyond repair by the pests and it physically just wipes the pests off. Yes, they will come back. You haven't eradicated them, but they won't cause any damage in the meantime. Of course, every now and then I also have to go to some chemicals to help with my pests. I mainly use Contender actually is the new one. It used to be Comfador Spray, now they renamed it to Contender. Um, that's the main one that I use, but I try and use it only if absolutely necessary. I don't necessarily want to use chemical solutions to pest treatments. I really only do it when I've been lazy with my proactive approach and I feel like these pests have well and truly taken over and a quick spray with water will not necessarily cut it. But um, yeah, when it comes to pests, I don't really have all too much advice to give you on exactly how to eradicate them because due to my proactive approach, I've never really had major pest issues. That doesn't mean that I don't have pests. I have pests at any given time in every single room of my collection. I promise you. If you want to find a spider mite, you'll find a spider mite. If you want to find thrips, you will find thrips. And you might even find a mealybug every now and then. Even though mealybugs, I have to say, I've had the least issues with. But they just don't really get to take over because I am pretty diligent with my proactive approach of just cleaning my plants. And I suppose that is how majority of the pest let's call it regulation, would be done in nature as well. It just bloody rains in the rainforest. I've never had spider mites on any of my plants growing in the garden. They really like it indoors. It's almost like putting your plants indoors is encouraging pests, not putting them outside, at least in my experience. But again, I grow in Sydney, we might be really lucky. Um, you might live somewhere else where you've got much hardier pests or I don't know. Um, but that is my experience and at the end of the day all I can do is really share my experience. The point I'm trying to make over here is that if you are a new plant parent and you find pests it's not going to be the end of the world. Just the sooner you get to accept the fact that there will be pests the sooner you'll actually enjoy the hobby. I hope. Talking about something else that's inevitable which is rot. I have experienced a lot of rot in my five to six years of growing plants. Stem rot, leaf rot, root rot. At the end of the day, it's all fungal and fungal as well as bacterial and viral diseases can also take over your plants and spread. And uh, sometimes there's very little you can do about it. Now, of course, you're trying to avoid this and you can avoid this by providing your plants with a good medium. I personally like to use a really chunky aeroid mix so that it's well draining and aerated because rot loves an anaerobic environment which is basically an environment devoid of oxygen. That's really where fungal issues thrive in and you will experience root rot and that is commonly referred to as overwatering, like you're providing too much water to your plant creating that anaerobic environment. Now, even the chunkiest aeroid mix in the world has not saved me from experiencing root rot. Um, you can also experience root rot by the plants by actually underwatering your plants. So your roots might dry out and then as, uh, as part of the drying out, they kind of die and then when you water it again, they won't magically come back to life. They'll just start rotting. Rotting is a very normal process. It happens, it, things decompose. You know, we're working with nature over here, so natural things like rot will also be normal. I'm not saying that is something that you should be aiming for. You definitely should try and prevent rot by, you know, giving a suitable uh, mix, uh, adjust your watering according to the mix, keep airflow up, uh, don't have water sitting on your leaves and so on, right? All of these things are things you can try and prevent fungal issues from happening. But if you grow a lot of plants and you grow plants for a long time like I find it very 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 unlikely for you to never ever encounter any form of fungal issues or rot and just because your plant has a bit of root rot here and there doesn't mean that the whole plant is dead it's just part of the growing journey so just accept it 
and find ways to first of all minimize it as I mentioned before airflow chunky air road mix aeration you know adjust your watering uh, but also find ways to cope with it once you identify that a plant has root rot maybe you need to repot it give it a fresh medium you can propagate that plant again in water you can use some H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, to help with uh, rot and for rot to not spread. You can just use very easy methods like just chop the rotten part off. Be a little, don't be too conservative. If you have like a stem and you see the rot is still here, don't chop here, chop here to make sure that really you got rid of the rotten part otherwise it will continue spreading so it's just normal i don't know if you've seen my video about my winter garden <laughs> i've had so much rot out there over the last um, two months because it is cold and wet and cold and wet is just encouraging fungal so it's normal it's fine it's not the end of the world you will be fine everything will be fine however Every now and then there might have been a little bit too many pests, there might have been a little bit too much rot and the plant will kind of unalive itself and that is also totally normal. If you have grown more than let's say like maybe 20, 30 plants, if you've grown for longer than two years, if you've ever done a propagation before, the chances of you not having unalived at least one plant is very, very slim. I have had so many casualties over the years, but every time a plant dies, it's like a learning curve for me. Most of the time, not always, sometimes a plant just says goodbye and I'm no smarter about this plant than I was before but most of the time I learn something from it and I can incorporate that into doing a better job with my next plant so that is also fine it's not the end of the world but it is one of the reasons why I don't like to put down the big bucks on plants because I'm just accepting the fact that they are living organisms and living organisms can die. Good segue into my next tip which is about plant prices. As I just mentioned, I don't like spending the big bucks on plants. That doesn't mean that I've never bought a plant for an absorbent amount of money because, you know, we all make bad calls every now and then. But you just have to accept that plant pricing is a result of demand and supply. If there's very low supply because it's rare, then usually the demand goes up because people just like things that are rare even if they're ugly. So the plant prices will go up. Just because a plant is expensive doesn't mean that the plant actually has a lot of value or that the plant is uh, valuable, right? It's still a plant and it can still die at any time if it costs a thousand bucks or ten. Actually the thousand dollar plant is more likely to die because if that plant was so easy to grow, why is there so little of them? there's probably a reason why they're so rare. So you just have to accept that plant prices will constantly fluctuate because it's demand and supply. And if you are trying to invest in plants or if you're seeing this plant hobby as an investment hobby and you're trying to buy plants, propagate them and then sell them on and make a profit out of it, then you just have to accept that that will not always work as with every other form of investment. Right? You can buy stock and the stock market can crash. You can buy a plant and that plant's pricing can also crash. Just accept that. That doesn't mean that you made a bad call or whatever, you know, like it is what it is. Don't beat yourself up over potentially having spent too much money on a plant that then maybe died or maybe you spent a lot of money on a plant that a year later came out of tissue culture and is now a tenth of the price and so on. It happens, but look, I've been there, I've done that, I've observed plant prices go up and down, I've observed plant prices be absolutely ridiculous, like five digits uh, all the way down to suddenly available for a hundred bucks. So that is just the way that our society works. And unfortunately, plants and the plant hobby is not immune to economic thinking. Next one, and I think we're at number eight. Some plants might just not be for you and that might not be just because of the price. I briefly touched on it earlier. We wanna grow plants as close as possible to their natural conditions. And if we do that, then we have chances of the plant thriving as closely as possible to the way that it would thrive in natural conditions. 
Now, if you're trying to grow a tropical plant, but you're living at the Arctic Circle, then you will most likely not have success with this plant. And that is not on you. That doesn't make you a bad plant parent. You basically, you basically gave yourself an impossible challenge. Well, let me correct that. Not necessarily impossible. It's impossible in a more or less natural way. You could, of course, uh, supplement your conditions a lot. You can get grow lights, humidifiers, heaters, and build your own tropical environment but that is most likely going to happen in the greenhouse or in an IKEA cabinet or in a grow tent it is very unlikely to happen in the middle of your room and I'm assuming you're here because you want to grow house plants and decorate your house with plants um, and if that's the case then you need to choose plants that are suitable to the conditions that you've got to offer in your house I personally would not be willing to go through that amount of effort. I want this hobby to be fun, right? I want to have a good time with this and I want to surround myself with plants that also have a good time being around me and not forcing them, uh, you know? So, I mean, at the end of the day, each to their own, but I think there would be a very small percentage of really hardcore growers that are willing to go that far. I have these plants as well. I've had, for example, and through in Vici, I can't really grow that plant really nicely. It just doesn't like me. It doesn't like my conditions. So I'm not going to get another one. I'll just give up on this plant. Philodendron biliatii. While I was able to grow it, the space commitment for me was just too much. I decided that this is just not the plant for me to grow. And it didn't even have anything to do with conditions. It actually had something to do with me not liking the growth pattern and so on. And that is also okay, just because a plant is like super trendy online or because other people online have said that this plant is super easy to grow. If it doesn't grow easily for you, then maybe just accept that as well. We are all different. We all have different conditions. We all have different preferences when it comes to caring. Like some people want to care for their plants once a fortnight and hope that that will be okay. It is okay if you grow a cacti or a low maintenance plant, but if you have a really high maintenance plant and the plant's already grown in suboptimal conditions, then your hands-off approach is definitely not going to work. So the sooner you'll accept that truth that not every single plant is worth it or not every single plant is yours to grow and just accept that some of them are not, the sooner you'll start enjoying this hobby or the sooner you'll enjoy this hobby to its full potential. Let's go to social media for your inspiration. Hopefully I give you some inspiration on some plants that you would really like to grow. If you don't have a good time looking after these plants, maybe try one more time, try twice or maybe three times, but don't force it. Why? Exactly. We want natural. We don't want to force things, right? Propagation is inevitable, in my opinion. <laughs> Sorry, in my head I just saw this pothos, you know, oh my god, and I've talked about it way too many times, but it is my absolute pet peeve when people grow a pothos and they're like, my pothos is 10 meters long. It's like, yeah, and it has three and a half leaves <laughs> across these 10 meters of stem. To me, that is the least aesthetically pleasing way of displaying plants and of course aesthetics are personal preference so somebody might fully disagree with it but these are my 10 hard-hitting truths not yours so I'll include it. When you grow plants indoors you are limited with space right there are ceilings there are walls there are pots and so on so at some stage to really get the best out of your plant and make your plant look good you will just have to chop that plant. It might have grown too large and it doesn't fit in your space anymore and you want to kind of cut it back or maybe the plant was a little bit sick based on fungal issues or based on pest issues or based on root rot and you have to kind of cut it back to start it fresh and propagate it to actually help the plant survive. The earlier you start being afraid of propagation or chopping things or like resetting plants, starting plants fresh, you know, uh, the earlier you can benefit from propagation. Propagation is one of the fun parts for, of this hobby for me. It helps you create 
uh, Lusha jungle. It also helps you swap plants with other plant friends and uh, get more variety into your jungle. It can also help you recoup some of the costs that you had uh, establishing your little indoor jungle in the first place. But also just from a pure aesthetic perspective, if you don't ever chop your plants, I don't know how you could possibly ever end up with an aesthetically pleasing display. These plants are growing. They will eventually take over and just go everywhere. Some people like that, but what happens when you need to maybe move the plant outside to give it a shower? Then what's happening with the part of the plant that's attached to the wall? Or what if you want to change it? Or what if that place doesn't suit the plant anymore? Anyway, I'll stop bitching about that pothos that's going to trail across all rooms of your house. But uh, aesthetics aren't the only reason why you need to propagate. So just accept it. Just accept the fact that at some stage you will have to take your scissors and you will have to cut that plant. And there's absolutely no reason to be afraid uh, about it. Usually good things happen from propagating. You had one plant and now suddenly you have ten. Uh, sometimes even propagating a plant and starting it fresh is faster than trying to fight a downward spiral. I have my varicosum video that I released the other day and I've been trying to get my mother plant to stop deteriorating for almost two years. In, that, in the meantime, I've taken a rescue plant from the nursery that had mealybugs, I chopped it into bits and I grew it up a moss pole and it is thriving. It has grown over 50 leaves across all of the vines that are propagated from that one initial plant that I rescued. Meanwhile, my mother plant has grown four. <laughs> so sometimes propagating is also speeding up the process. It's like, you know, with bonsai, for example, not that I grow bonsais or know much about bonsais, but with bonsais, you need to chop them back to get the desired bonsai effect, right? There's so many plants in gardens, you actually have to completely chop back or have to at least chop back to an extent over the colder seasons for them to come back in the warmer season. It's just this cycle. Especially when you're trying to grow plants large and you grow them on moss poles, they will reach the top of the moss pole. It's inevitable. So you will have to do something about it. You will have to propagate that plant. You will have to chop it. So embrace it rather than be afraid of it. It's a learning curve. Which leads me to the last thing. There is no such thing as a green thumb. Growing plants is a skill that is learned or acquired through trial and error. Some people do research. I personally, I'm personally having a really hard time researching plants like in theory, like reading something about it and trying to kind of really remember that. I learn through experiences. I rather unalive a plant and learn something from it because that lesson I will not forget, most likely, rather than somebody telling me what I should have done in the first place. It doesn't stick. That's not how my brain works. My brain works through remembering my own experiences, but everybody is different. But one thing we all have in common is that nobody was born with a green thumb. We all just learned. We might have learned through different means or through different avenues or in different speeds Eats. But at the end of the day, it's just a learning curve. Of course, conditions play a role as well, but it's also a learning curve to understand your conditions and act accordingly. It's also a learning curve to understand your conditions and choose plants accordingly. It's also a learning curve to understand your conditions and supplement your conditions if required and so on, right? And so at the end of the day, it's still a skill. Even if you have an 100% automated setup where all of your plants are watered automatically and uh, you know the humidity and the, the lights and the temperature everything is automated it was a learning curve to set up the automation in the first place and understand what temperature what level of humidity and so on these plants want it's a skill it's knowledge based right it is not an inherent talent. At the end of the day, everybody can grow a houseplant. It just depends on how badly you want to grow this plant. If you want a ginormous indoor jungle, but you don't want to put any effort into learning something about the plants, making mistakes, you don't want to be patient enough to make your learnings and let the plants grow, then yeah, most likely you will not be successful with this. But if you know that you are really passionate about this and you are happy to make your learnings and you're happy to accept failure and you are happy to be patient and you know just accept the fact that it's, it's more about the journey than the end result, then you will acquire the required skills and you will make 
make learnings. And despite having all of the learnings and the skills and all of the knowledge, you will still experience failure. As I mentioned, you will still unalive plants. You will still have browning leaves. You will still have imperfections. Having these imperfections, having these things go wrong does not mean that you don't have a green thumb. Imagine an athlete who has trained their whole life to be really, really good at a specific sport who now has an injury and can't practice that sport for the next six months. That doesn't make him not an athlete. He's just had a little setback. He'll come back. Simone Biles, she was well, she won four gold in what was before Tokyo, Rio. She won four golds in Rio. In Tokyo, she had to leave the competition because she didn't feel right. Like there was, it wasn't clicking, like her mind-body connection wasn't there. And now in Paris, she won three again. So even somebody who is the greatest of all time in her sport has had a rough patch in between where she was not at her peak. That doesn't make her a terrible athlete. She actually turned it around and became the greatest of all time after all, right? So, I mean, I don't know if you guys are all as passionate about sports as I am, but I like to make sporty references because I think it, it makes sense, right? With sports, everybody accepts the fact that, oh, a lot of dedication and work and exercise goes into it. Why would it be any different with any other hobby that you might have, right? So, yeah, I also have plants that are dying, I have failures and so on, that doesn't mean that all of my success stories over the last four to five years and my successful growth journeys of some of my plants are void and it also doesn't mean that I will never be able to grow a nice plant ever again. Just means that, you know, well, maybe I was a bit lazy, maybe I was a bit late, maybe some other unfortunate things happened and I just accept that. And that doesn't give me more or less of a green thumb than I had before or after or whatever. If you're quite new to this hobby, I hope this really helped you in, you know, knowing first of all what you face, but also knowing that by the time you get to that part of the journey, that this is not a reflection on you or you haven't done anything wrong, that this is just part of the journey and uh, hopefully you'll have an easier time accepting it. The, the thing I hate the most is when I read comments where people are like, oh my God, I'm so anxious that XYZ is going to happen to my plant or, oh my God, I couldn't sleep all night because I couldn't figure out what's wrong with my plant or uh, this plant didn't survive. It makes me feel like I really don't have a green thumb. Maybe this hobby isn't for me and so on. I hate reading these comments. It's so disheartening and I want people to enjoy this hobby and I want as many people as possible to enjoy this hobby and I think a lot of the enjoyment part obviously comes from having success but I think a lot of the enjoyment part is also a mindset. I'm gonna do one more sporty reference if you don't mind. You don't have to be Novak Djokovic to enjoy playing tennis. You know what I mean? You don't need to be the best in the world. You don't need to be the greatest of all time. You don't need to have like the most amazing collection anybody has ever had. There will always be a person that has bigger plants, better plants, more beautiful plants, more knowledge, a rarer plant, a more unique looking plant and so on. Same goes for me. Like, yes, some of you might look at my plants and they're like, oh my God, why are you yapping about all of this? You have the most amazing plants, whatever. Not true. I also look at other people on Instagram and I get plant envy and I catch myself getting plant envy and then I just need to remind myself that, you know what, I'm not growing plants competitively. This is actually not a competition. I am allowed to enjoy my hobby irrespective of my success. It's the same with sports. Imagine only the best person in the world would be able to enjoy their sport. Would that not be so boring? There's people that enjoy just being at the Olympics, even if they don't even make it past round one. Just being at the Olympics is already an achievement because they have dedicated so much time and effort into this. If dedication is all it takes, then let's go for it. Anyway, I'm going way off topic and I'm uh, like one step away from being a motivational speaker at this stage. So I should probably have less coffee and wrap up this video. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching though. I hope you enjoyed it. I would love for you to leave a comment down below uh, with a plant failure of yours. Like what was a big plant fail that you had and what did you learn from it? So we can all read through the comment section and kind of learn from each other and also at the same time realize that we are all facing failure. We've all had it. So um, let's normalize that. Alrighty. Yes, it's dinner time, my darling. Okay, we are saying goodbye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Ah! Quick! Quick! Oh my god, starving! Call Peter!